An American Plague by Jim Murphy. Chapter 2. All was not right. Eight or ten persons buried out of Water Street between Race and Arch Streets. Many sick in our neighborhood and in Yee City generally. Elizabeth Drinker. August 21st, 1793. Monday, August 19th. It was clear that 33-year-old Catherine LeMajor was dying and dying horribly and painfully. Between agonized gasps and groans, she muttered that her stomach felt as if it were burning up. Every ten minutes or so, her moaning would stop abruptly, and she would vomit a foul black bile. Her husband, Peter, called in two neighborhood doctors to save his young wife. One was Dr. Hugh Hodge, whose own daughter had been carried off by the same fever just days before. Hodge had been an army surgeon during the Revolutionary War, and while stubborn and crusty in his ways, he was a respected physician. The other was Dr. John Falk, who was a fellow of Philadelphia's prestigious College of Physicians and a member of the Pennsylvania Hospital Board. Hodge and Falk did what they could for their patient. They gave her cool drinks of barley water and apple water to reduce the fever, and red wine and laudanum to help her rest. Her forehead, face, and arms were washed regularly with damp cloths. Nothing worked, and Catherine LeMajor's condition worsened. Her pulse slowed, her eyes grew bloodshot, her skin took on the pale yellow color that gave the disease its name. More black vomit came spewing forth. In desperation, the two physicians sent for their esteemed colleague, Dr. Benjamin Rush, Rush was 47 years old and so highly respected that he was often called in by his colleagues when they were baffled by a case. His medical training had been extensive, consisting of five years of apprenticeship with the preeminent doctor in the United States, John Redman. After this, he had gone to Europe to study under the most skilled surgeons and doctors in the Western world. He was passionate and outspoken in his beliefs, no matter what the subject. He opposed slavery, felt that alcohol and tobacco should be avoided, urged that the corporal punishment of children be stopped, and thought that the best way to keep a democracy strong was by having universal education. Along with his beliefs went an unimaginable amount of energy. Despite a persistent cough and weak lungs that often left him gasping for air, he worked from early in the morning until late at night, writing letters and papers, visiting patients, reading the latest medical literature, or attending to any one of a number of institutions and charities he belonged to. Hodge and Folk told Rush about Catherine Lemaire's symptoms and what they had done to help her. There was nothing much else they could do, Rush said, after the three men left her bedchamber to discuss the case. Rush then noticed that in, a, that in recent days he had seen an unusual number of bilious fevers, accompanied with symptoms of uncommon malignity. In a grave voice, his seriousness reflected in his intense blue eyes, he added that all was not right in our city. The two other doctors agreed, and then all three recounted symptoms they had seen. The sickness began with chills, headache, and a painful aching in the back, arms, and legs. A high fever developed, accompanied by constipation. This stage lasted around three days, and then the fever suddenly broke and the patient seemed to recover, but only for a few short hours. The next stage saw the fever shoot up again. The skin and the eyeballs turned yellow as red blood cells were destroyed, causing the bile pigment bilirubin to, accompany, to accumulate in the body. Nose, gums, and intestines began bleeding, and the patient vomited stale black blood. Finally, the pulse grew weak, the tongue turned to dry brown, and the victim became depressed, confused, and delirious. Rush noted another sign as well, tiny reddish eruptions on the skin. They, apparent, they appear chiefly on the arms, but they sometimes extend it to the breast. Physicians called these sores pedicea, which is Latin for skin spots, and Rush observed that they resembled mosquito bites. Hodge then pointed out that the deaths, including his daughters, had all happened on or near Water Street. 
Folk told the other, told of other deaths along the street and said he knew the origin of the fevers, the repulsive smell in the air caused by the rotting coffee on Ball's Wharf. The idea that illness was caused by microscopic organisms such as bacteria and viruses was not known at the time. Instead, doctors based their medical thinking on the 2,500-year-old Greek humoral theory. This concept, this concept stated that good health resulted when body fluids, called humors, were in balance. The humors were phlegm, collar, bile, and blood. Disease arose from an imbalance of these humors. Too much of one, not enough of another. Any number of things could cause this condition, such as poor diet, excess drinking, poison, or a dog bite, to name just a few. Even bad news could unsettle the humors and cause illness. So it made sense to Rush, Hodge, and Folk that the putrid-smelling air could upset people enough to cause an outbreak of violent, fatal fevers. Rush, however, sent something else. The symptoms he was seeing reminded him of a sickness that had swept through Philadelphia back in 1762, when he was 16 years old and studying under Dr. Redman. Rush was never shy with his opinions. And standing there in the LeMayer's parlor, he boldly announced that the disease they now confronted was the dreaded yellow fever. Putting the name yellow fever to, to the illness was not to be done lightly. Yellow fever was one of the most vicious diseases in the diseases in the world and could create panic anywhere. It appeared suddenly, savaged its victims' bodies, and because there was absolutely no cure, killed at an alarming pace. While mortality rates for yellow fever varied wildly, it was not unusual for it to kill 50% of those who contracted it. What is more, the stench of a yellow fever victim's body, bodily evacuations and breath, the odor from their soiled clothes and bed linens, and even the air that escaped from the sick room, was believed by many to spread the disease with lightning speed. Rush had, in short, announced that Philadelphia was in the grip of a deadly, unstoppable plague. Hodge and Folk thought they and their colleagues needed to see and discuss more fever cases before putting a name to the disease, especially such a terrifying name. A mistake would disrupt the workings of the city for no reason. Rush understood this well, but he did not waver from his diagnosis. Once his mind was made up, he rarely changed it. After Rush left the LeMajor's house, he made it a point to tell his friends about the reappearance of yellow fever and he advised them all to leave the city. He visited the mayor of Philadelphia, Matthew Clarkson, and the governor of Pennsylvania, Thomas Mifflin, to inform them as well. Next, he went about town to confer with other doctors. On Monday, August 19th, and for several days after that, the fever was still pretty much confined to the Water Street area near Ball's Wharf. Only a handful of doctors had encountered it firsthand. Therefore, most of the city's 80 physicians did not believe that the illness described by Rush was indeed yellow fever. They felt that the disorder must be one of the more common fevers that often struck during warm weather. Among the possibilities mentioned were jail fever, camp fever, eruptive military fever, and autumnal fever. Any of these could cause violent physical suffering and death. Rush was annoyed that his diagnosis and warnings were being treated with ridicule or contempt. But he shrugged off these doctors as ignorant. They would come around to his view in time, he knew. He only hoped it wouldn't be too late. Meanwhile, the deaths kept coming at an alarming rate. Catherine Lemaire died on Tuesday, despite the efforts of her three highly skilled physicians. On Wednesday, 12 more died, 13 died on Thursday. Others, besides the doctors, were beginning to notice the illness. The Reverend J. Henry C. Helmuth found himself visiting more and more of his congregation with fevers of a most dangerous complexion. He stopped by the home of a man that Monday and made sure he was well taken care of and comfortable. Nevertheless, to my great surprise, he was a corpse on the, on the 20th, Helmuth reported bluntly. "'Tis a sickly time in Philida." 
another citizen, Elizabeth Drinker, wrote. And there has been an unusual number of funerals lately here. A few days later, she would add, "'Tis really an alarming and serious time. The fever has assumed a most alarming appearance, Rush wrote to his wife. Julia, who was summering in Princeton with their youngest children, it not only mocks in most instances the power of medicine, but it has spread through several parts of the city remote from the spot of where it originated. Not just the fever spread, word of it spread as well. That Thursday, Mayor Clarkson placed a notice in the newspaper saying there was great reason to apprehend that a dangerous infectious disorder was loose in the city. He ordered laborers hired by the city, called scavengers, to clean the streets of decaying garbage and dead animals, since their vile smell might well be causing the disease. Governor Mifflin was equally upset. The state legislature was scheduled to assemble on Tuesday, August 27th, and he was to deliver a formal speech on the condition of Pennsylvania. Should the meeting be canceled, he wondered if the fever really was so dangerous, and should he and his family leave the city? He then asked that the health officer of the port and the port physician investigate the disorder and issue a report. Both the mayor and the governor wanted to confront and contain the disease as quickly as possible. They also wanted to keep the citizens of Philadelphia calm by showing that they were taking firm steps to deal with the problem. But it was already too late. Thursday's newspapers had been read by thousands of individuals. These people spoke with neighbors and friends and business associates about the dangerous infectious disorder. This group then spread the alarming news even further. The city's taverns buzzed with talk of the strange killing fever, as did the street markets and shops. Rain fell on Saturday, but it didn't stop the death carts from rumbling through the streets, carrying 17 more people to their graves. They are dying on our right hand and on our left, wrote 21-year-old Isaac Heston to his brother. We have it opposite us, in fact, all around us. Greater the number, called to the grave. Fear, it seemed, was spreading even faster than the, than the disease. On Sunday, August 25th, a savage storm hit the city, bringing winds and turrets of rain. Water cascaded off roofs splashed loudly onto the sidewalk, and ran in burbling rivers through the streets. The howling wind and pounding rain made a frightful noise, and yet through it all a single chilling sound could be heard, the awful tolling of church bells.